this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. This is The Creative Life Podcast with James Taylor, episode number three. The Creative Life Podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today. His name is Tommy Emmanuel, a very longtime friend. I'm really excited to have him on the show. Tommy is an Australian guitarist and composer, and as well as being one of the most mesmerizing live performers you'll ever see, he has also received two Grammy nominations, two ARIA awards, and repeated honors in the Guitar Player Magazine Reader's Poll. In 2010, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. He has worked with Eric Clapton, Doc Watson, Les Paul, Martin Taylor, John Denver, and Chet Atkins. And in 2000, he performed live at the closing ceremony of the Sydney Olympics, a performance that was watched by 2.85 billion, yes, that's billion, viewers worldwide. Tommy, welcome to the show. James, good to hear your voice and that that, that lovely Ayrshire accent. <laughs> that lovely Ayrshire lilt. So <laughs> share, with, share with the listeners what's going on in your world just now. What's happening? Well, um, I've just been uh, on an uh, interesting trip the last two weeks. We, my management and I planned uh, for me to uh, meet all the uh, people that I'm working with that I haven't had a chance to meet yet. And I'm talking about promoters in California. Uh, I'm talking about uh, my publishing people, Universal. Uh, I went in and met with, with all the people uh, in L.A. and in New York who I haven't had a chance to meet. And I took a little amp and a guitar in and I played them some of my, my new compositions and, you know, tried to get them all excited about my, my new album. I have a new album out as of uh, two weeks ago. It's called It's Never Too Late. And um, so that, that, that's what I was doing. I was, I was going out and uh, playing for people. I also visited Polestar and I did um, a pretty much a half day shooting uh, uh, songs and instruction for uh, a magazine called Guitar World based in New York. And I did four songs in two sections. So they, they'll, they'll put up the video, but they'll also write a column in their magazine for each part that I, I, uh, I put up. So people will be able to read the music and the tablature and then watch the video so they can learn the songs. So, and then at the end of that run, the last four nights, I just did four concerts in a row um, on the eastern seaboard here um, in... Uh, uh, Inglewood, um, Albany, New York, uh, and uh, Tarrytown, New, New Jersey. And then last night I was in Providence, Rhode Island. So, so of, of all the musicians I think I've ever worked with, you're probably the one that is most um, what I would consider true live, uh, live arts, live performing artist. I mean, every time I look at your, your schedule, you're you're everywhere. You're you're constantly yeah. touring. So, what is it about the the live experience that that does it for you? Why why do you go through all the aggravations of air, airlines and uh, checking into hotels and doing all that stuff? What is it about that that live experience that's so special for you? Well, there's nothing like playing to an audience. There's no feeling like it. Although I'd, I'd have to just say right now, James that I love playing in studio just as much. I don't get to do it as much as I used to, but I feel that sense of creativity uh, pulsing through me when I'm in the studio. And if, I, if I've got you know, headphones, a good microphone, and a good sound, it, it just helps me take it to another level as far as I'm concerned. But the, that, that thrill of playing to an audience it's like the worst drug you've ever taken, you know, like it's so addictive. And, and, and then you kind of walk that line of you, you want to get out there and really fly your kite and see where you can take it. But you know that you have to put a show together and entertain people for two and a, two and a half hours. You have to, you know, take people away from their ordinary life and take them to another zone almost 
And that's a great job because it's like being in the happiness business. You know, you start playing and people all get happy and they forget everything. And that's the wonderful thing about playing music for a living and for, for people um, is that you're there to do a job to make the world a better place. You're using your gifts and what, whatever talent you've been given, you're, you've got to use that for the benefit of everyone else. And, and how did you develop this talent? Uh, when, I, when, I, when we talk about talent here, I'm, the question I'm asking is, like, how did you develop the talent, obviously, as a, as a technical talent, as a guitarist, but also how did you develop that talent of being able to get up there on stage for two and a half hours and entertain and enthrall? That's not something that you learn over, overnight. So how did you develop those, that, those two things, that they can have the craft of what you do and then the art of what you do? Right. I think a lot of it goes back to my childhood and when I was younger and that um, when I got a reaction from the audience, I thought, okay, they like that. Uh, I'll do more of that, you know. So <laughs> when, I, when I first started playing um, uh, solo, uh, aside from playing in a band, I found that I had to really step up the intensity in my playing um, and I tried to get as clever as I could with my arrangements so they were interesting. And um, it, it taught me to dig deep and to find ideas and to, to take a song and turn it upside down and try to make it interesting uh, for the public. And I'd also have to say growing up in Australia has really uh, helped me so much because I know what hard work is. I know how to entertain an audience because I played to so many who didn't care who was up there and, and I had to get their attention. Um, so I think that um, my work ethic uh, and my sense of fun at, at the same time has really helped me to develop into a concert performer that, you know, I don't work to a list when I go out on stage, I, I just jump off and see what's going to happen. And I've got a repertoire and I have a, a set of uh, ideas that I think really work and that I know I can count on. So I, I just walk out there and start playing and see where it wants to go. And um, I leave as much space as I can for me to improvise and to, to go off into any direction I want. Sometimes the audiences who uh, are, are really vocal and they'll start singing out for songs. So instead of playing what I was going to play, I start playing requests. And, and then it turns into a lot of fun, you know. So, so th this is something that's, that's different from a lot of other um, musicians and it's, when I think about you and your live show, I often think it's it's more similar to going and seeing like one of these great um, comedians that's up on stage, or someone even like someone like a Tony Robbins or someone who's a great public speaker. So you can see in in what they're doing, there's certain pieces that they have. Obviously, they they're planned, you know, to certain things that work well together, like building blocks. But then Absolutely. you have this extemporous, extemporaneous, if that's such a word, if I just made that word up, um, this improvisational yeah, nature of what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> improvisational nature of what you're doing, because that, yeah. that for, for most musicians, the idea of getting up on stage with no, no, no band, no one around you, and doing that, um, the only time I've ever seen that same thing, I've seen it in you and I've seen it in other kind of top uh, solo musicians, the only time I've ever seen that same way of going at a live show is either like a, like a, a Tony Robbins, a top um, speaker, or actually comedians who are very, very good and who are able to do that. So that, yeah. it, it, that are you just so used to that thing now, of just kind of going up and doing it solo, you don't even think about it anymore? Yeah. Well, you know what? People often ask me, uh, they say, what do you do to prepare? You know, do you, uh, do you meditate? Do you, uh, you, do you pray? Do you, uh, you know, how much do you practice and blah, 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 and all this. And they, they don't realize that 99% of it is uh, I'm already prepared. Yeah. And, and my attitude is I can't wait to get out there. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, oh, I hope they're going to like me or blah, blah, blah. My attitude is, Wait till I start playing, and then then we're going to have a lot of fun, you know. And and it's not ego driven. It's it's um, uh, I know that that 
every time I give, give my best, which is every time I go out there, I can pretty much guarantee you everyone's going to have a great time. And that's really what it's all about. The only time that I ever get let down is usually by my, by my own doing. If, I, if something happens like uh, uh, I have a bad night with the sound or something, which is pretty rare, but I struggle with the sound. And so when I struggle with the sound, then I struggle to be creative. And, 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 but the bottom line also, James, is that even on my worst night, I know that I can stand on my songs and my arrangements. I can depend on them to get me through the night, even if I'm not, you know, um, feeling the magic and the mojo. Uh, if, if, uh, if it's not there, then I know the songs and the arrangements will stand. I can, they'll stand up, you know. So an artist like you that's on the road so much, I mean, what does the first hour of your day look like? Usually in the first hour is um, I'll wake up and drink a big glass of water. Um, call, if, if I'm on my own, if, I, if my wife and daughter are not with me, then I'll call them first thing. Um, and then I, I like to eat cereal and yogurt and uh, drink a cup of coffee and uh, pack my bag and get ready to check out of the hotel and get to the next place. That's a normal morning for me when I'm on the road. When I, uh, depending on what's going on, that, that's a very normal morning. Um, sometimes I get to read the paper, and sometimes I have a song in my head and I get my guitar out be, before breakfast and start playing and going over stuff. Uh, this morning when I got up at 5 a.m., my guitar was beside my bed, so I picked it up and started playing a little a kind of blues improvisation and I chose B flat this morning for some reason and I just liked the sound of it and I kind of, you know, played around for about 10 minutes before I had to put my guitar away and jump in the shower and get ready. So, you know, a normal morning for me is, uh, you know, drink my glass of water, call my wife, have my breakfast, pack my bags, go. And uh, I believe you, you, your, your wife, two very good things have happened since you met your, your wife. One, I heard, obviously, you've now got um, a new arrival. Um, uh, so eight months old. <laughs> <well. That's laughs> so you've got that happening. And the other thing that um, your wife told me, Clara told me the other day, was um, you now have a juicer. When she's on the road with you, you, uh, you have a yeah. green smoothie maker, like a Nutribullet type I thing, do. goes on yeah. the road with you. Yes, I, I do. And, and I make smoothies on, on the road. Um, I make them with coconut water, or, um, uh, fruit like um, uh, bananas and uh, blueberries, stuff like that. And then we put kale and lots of greens and protein and stuff like that in there. Sometimes we throw in avocado uh, and um, oh, d different seed oils and stuff like that. So that, that's been great for us. That's been great for our, our health. And, and uh, what, what's it like having having a little one on the on the road? Because because I know she's been coming. I think you've been in Europe recently. And yeah, she's, she's been on the on the road with you as well. How 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 is that? Well, you have to do it. There's a lot more to be done, and you have to prepare a lot earlier because she's going to take up all your time, and you've still got to leave by a certain time because the rest of the crew are waiting. You know, so, a little lobby call. so uh, it, it just means that we have that much more to do. Um, uh, logistically, you know, we've got to pack an extra bag. We've got to make sure she's fed at the right time. We've got to change of clothes and we're prepared, you know. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all part of life, ha having a young family. And uh, uh, you, you just go about your business and get it done, you know. And what would you say is your, your biggest weakness as a, as a music artist and as a, as a creative person? My biggest weakness uh, that I can't read music. Uh, I can I can write you a song. I can play uh, you know lots of songs in lots of keys and all that kind of stuff. But I can't write anything down on paper. So it, it means I I can't go out and buy songs in books and sheet music and stuff and play it because I can't read it. Um, but when you come come up with new ideas for new songs, so you're you can you can write them or you or you'll just record no. them. 
I just I, I, I use repetition to to remember the, the the stuff, but then I I just record it on a little recording device. Sometimes I just use my my iPhone and and just record it on there. So is that because I, I know before you kind of came into the world really as a solo artist, you were you know you were a studio musician for you know, a right. good good while. So. When I think of studio musicians, I think you know these like have to be like the top guys at reading. So how how cool. did you cope with being a session musician and and not being a, <clears throat> being a, a reader in that way? Okay, well, no one ever booked me from for uh, to to come in and sight read anything because I told them straight up, I cannot read, but you put anything in front of me and I'll have a go at it. You know that was my my attitude. And I got so much work that I almost killed myself working, you know. <laughs> uh, and it, it's a lot to do with not, not just your, your abilities, but your, your attitude, you know. Like, I'm, I'm happy that someone asked me to play like Django Reinhardt this morning. Or I'm, I'm happy that they wanted me to play an ACDC song um, or to sound like a flamenco player. I, I can have a go at everything and make it sound fairly convincing as far as being a studio player goes. Uh, and that, for me, was just as fun, just as much fun and just as much creativity to come up with those things, you know. And what about on the flip side? What would you say is your biggest strength? Um, my Probably my... Uh, quality control when, when, when it comes to song choice uh, and arrangements. Um, and I think one of my strengths is that I know who I am and what I'm here for. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't let anything sway me from that, you know. So that must provide um, a real kind of clarity then in terms of your thinking because, you know, you know, this is my purpose, exactly. this, is, this is what I'm about. Yeah. Yeah, and and I'm I'm happy to say, you know, you say say if you were some famous producer and you said I want you to come and play, you know, uh, a certain guitar style on this track, and I might immediately say, well, there's people out there better at that than me, so why don't you call, you know, Steve Lukather or someone like that to play this hard rock solo or whatever. But, uh, you know, uh, I, when I get the call about things I feel are my strengths, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy to have a go at it. <coughs> um, so I guess part of that inner strength is, is your honesty about what you do as well. So talk to, us and talk to the listeners about a time in your life when you've worked on a project and you've kind of given, given <coughs> it your all. But for whatever yeah. reason, it just hasn't worked out. And more importantly, what were the lessons that you learned from that experience? Okay. Well, let's go back to 1979. <coughs> and I was asked to work on a film in Australia. And I got really involved in it and threw myself, you know, totally 100% into it. And um, I wrote all the songs with a friend of mine who was a, a good lyricist. Um, there was such – there was a um, – a deadline to meet, and I had the whole soundtrack to the film mapped out, recorded in demo form. <coughs> I even worked with them on the script and did the screen tests with the other actors because it was a, it was a song about people in the music business. It was a film <coughs> about uh, people in the music business, and when I read the script, I, I just said, people in the music business don't talk like this. You know, they had, uh, some of the dialogue was really stupid. And so I got together with them and rewrote the script and I, and I did all this work and I brought it to a point where we were ready to go and the tax laws changed in Australia pretty much overnight and all the backers for the film took, pulled their money out and the film never, ever got made. And I, I walked away from it being owed a lot of money but I, I learned so much from it and I, I felt that I didn't uh, crack under pressure and I, I loved the challenge of the whole thing. And when, when the red light was on, I, I had to deliver, you know, and um, it, it, it showed me that, that anything's possible. 
So, you know, that that story, that experience that you had there of like kind of giving a project your all and it, it just it didn't work out for no no fault of your own because they changed some tax, tax laws. You know, a lot of musicians, a lot of people involved in a project like that would would kind of just they would give up completely you know they you know and um it's it's not uncommon to hear people in the business who've had experiences like that and it's it's really kind of it's kind of destroyed them or it's certainly put things on, yeah. a, on a hold for a long long period of time but obviously there was something in you that took that experience and kind of flipped it around and used it for your you know use it to your benefit as well and use it to kind of say okay well, i've I, i'll learn from this when when my wife got to know me before we, she was my wife when she was my partner, she turned to me one day and said, you never do things by half, do you? You know, and I said to her, never, uh, I never will. And, and if, I, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it absolutely full out and to my best ability, you know, um, because I learned a long time ago that that's the only way that I know of how to get anywhere is to give it absolutely everything I got. And, I, and I, I've educated myself as much as I can from uh, people who I find inspiring, people who are leaders and winners uh, in all fields, especially in sporting uh, arena and uh, not only in, in music but also in film. Um, I remember reading an article on the great Ivan Lendl, the great tennis player, and the, the uh, journalist said to him, what was your most humiliating moment on the court? And he said, I always give my best effort. So even if I don't win, I, I, I'm never humiliated because I know I gave my best. And that, that for me, you know, I, I had a quiet moment to myself where I said to myself, that's exactly how I think. Mm -hmm. And he's just confirmed it to me, you know. And tell us about uh, an aha idea or some kind of light bulb moment in your your life and your journey to making music with it. With it, with it, you know that light bulb just kind of went on. You said, "Okay, this is what this is a, a new distinction I've made or a new understanding, a new way that I need to be thinking about things." Okay, um, I think that if I could just say that, I think the greatest thing I've ever learned, uh, apart from to love and be loved, like uh, Nat King Cole once said. But uh, I think the greatest thing that I could tell you is that when I came to the realization that it's my responsibility to take, re I have to take responsibility for myself and my actions and everything that I do, I have to be solely responsible. And that was a great moment for me because you kind of, through, through um, either religion or through uh, people telling you that you, you, know, you, you, you need to gather the right people around you and you need to do this and do that, I, I, I think I realized that it's up to me to make things happen. It's up to me to find the right people to help me move forward in my life and achieve the goals that I believe are possible. And then that all starts with your vision of where you belong. And... My vision has always been, I'm a concert player, I should be in concert halls, that's what, I, that's what I've got to do, you know. And then uh, a friend of mine had a talk with me one day and he said, well, look, you know, where do you want to be? And I said, well, I'm, you know, and I pointed to the ceiling. I said, I want to be up there, I want to be on the top. He said, well, the only way you're going to get there is to take these steps. And when you get there, you're not surprised because you took the steps in which to get yourself there. So uh, I think that that's one of the greatest lessons I've learned, that, it, that I have to take responsibility for my actions, for, for my wins and losses and, and lessons along the way. And I have to be responsible. And you're talking about, you know, that, that journey kind of going up, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to get to the top. I heard a, a quote the other day from, uh, it was a gentleman from, uh, and I've now forgotten his name. He plays the, the US American president in the Netflix series, Kevin. And I've just suddenly, his name's Spacey. gone out. Kevin Spacey. Yeah. He had a great yeah. line and he said, if you're lucky to get the elevator success, remember to send it back down. Um, and so, so send it back down. Send it, you know, for the next, next people. And so something I, I, I see at your shows 
and, uh, and maybe a lot of people don't don't know this about you, but you've always make time for um, young players that are coming through yeah. um, to spend time with them either before the show or after the show. Every night. Every single and yeah, you, you do that every every, every night. night. Yeah, and I meet people. I sometimes people just want to shake your hand and get a photo. Sometimes people have that, a burning desire to ask you questions. Sometimes they they just want to tell you something about their life. Um, you know, and you just never know how people are going to be affected. And you've got to remain an open spirit, you know, like an open channel to to people, and and or almost be in a neutral position where, you know, they can ask you anything and feel comfortable to do that. Um, and that's one of the, that's one of the really lovely parts of my, my daily experience. And also I turn around and tell, tell them, I said, well, I've just sapped you of all your enthusiasm. <laughs> now I'm going to give it back to you when I walk out on stage. Yeah. And so you, you've had some obviously very influential people in your life that have Kind yeah. of been there as mentors and advisors to you. They're probably most one of the most famous is Chet Atkins, and, yeah. and you very very close to Chet Atkins. And so maybe yeah. talk to me about you know what what were some of the best advice you ever received from from Chet? Uh, and it could be about music, or it could be maybe around life in general. Well, absolutely. You know, there were several things I could say. First of all, um, I would tell him about a song that I'd written, and the first thing he'd say to me is. Can you sing the melody? That was the first thing. The second thing was I was uh, trying to uh, drop in a solo on a song and I was, you know, improvising and I had about four or five goes at it and I wasn't really happy with, with what I was doing and I just, I don't know, I had like a block. And he walked into the room and stood there for a second and looked at me and I said, any suggestions like that? And he just said, well, you can't beat the melody. And then he just turned around <laughs> and walked out. Right? So I quoted the melody to start the solo off, and I got it first take. And uh, he just brought me right back to what's important. Play the melody, you know. And, and what was it about Chet? Obviously, you've been heavily influenced by, by Chet. But what was it about Chet, the, the player, and Chet, the man, that, that inspired you? Um. Well, it didn't matter if you were the the waiter in a in a, a a mom and pop restaurant, or you were the president of the United States. He treated you the same. You know, he was a wonderful, wonderful person, kind, gentle, um, uh, but he was tough in his own way as well. Um, but he was a, a, a quite the. A, a great friend uh, and a um, a great gentleman to 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 people, and you know, not a trace of of uh, you know uh, ego and stuff like that. He he had a great way of of laughing at himself, and and uh, you know, I, he was a, such a good person to be around. But he had that quality control, you know, and I think that's what what always was like the the armor plating in in his whole life was his quality control you know uh, whether it came to song choice arrangement things or songs for other artists things like that he was he just had a great ear for it and um you know he used to say fight mediocrity tooth and nail <laughs> and I know a lot of these listeners that will be listening today are are uh, guitarists themselves. And okay. and rather than you know, I thought you know, rather than just talking about the the gear that that you play, I know you play mate on guitars and mm -hmm. you know AER apps and, and and a lot of that stuff's available for people to go and find online about the, you know the, the gear that you use. But the thing I, that I was interested in is like what what are the apps what's on your iphone what's what websites do you, do you go to that you would recommend to our listeners that they check out whether they you know they if they especially okay. if they're guitar players okay well i i'm not a big tech tech head uh, to be honest jt i've um uh i've got a few apps in my phone but they're mainly things like where i can hide passwords and things like that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got tile uh, I, I've got that company tile yeah. where I 
I've got these little things hidden inside my guitar cases, and and if my guitar goes missing or gets stolen or whatever, we can track it and we know exactly where it is. Ah, clever. Yeah. And so I, would, that's the tile. I would imagine you you're using a lot of like in terms of apps because you're always on planes and you're always traveling. So are, are you using a lot of like uh, travel apps or no, you, know, no. so, so you don't I, use I don't, any apps? I don't do any of that. Uh, I'm pretty boring when it comes to that kind of thing. I have a tour manager who handles all my, my travel and all that. I just turn up and he hands me a boarding pass and I walk on board. Um, and when I get on board, you know what I do? Crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> and are, are there any little um, kind of rituals that you have before, you know, when you, let's say, you turn up at the show, um, at the venue, you do, your, you do your sound check, but are there any like either kind of pre-show rituals that you do to kind of help you, because um, yeah, you, you, you're in different dressing rooms every single night, that, yeah. what are the things that you do so you can feel comfortable? Okay, first thing I do is get my guitar out of the case, put it on the table in front of me, I, I get out my little tools and things that I change strings with um, because I, I generally change strings on my main guitar every night about an hour before the show. So they're brand new and sparkly and have beautiful rich overtones and bell-like qualities to them and they really tune up well and stuff like that. Um, what, I, what I love to do uh, after I've changed my strings and everything and stretched everything in is to, is to play the guitar for probably 15 minutes as if I'm on stage. I, I go back out after sound check, plug into my gear and play as if the audience is in front of me and just get my little motor running, you know, mm. and, uh, and, and I'm in the zone, you know. And I also enjoy sometimes at sound check I'll do stuff that I would never do on, during the show, like uh, I'll sing Elvis songs and Buddy Holly songs and stuff like that just to play and sing and and do something different, you know. I, and then once I'm happy with all the sound and everything, then sometimes I, uh, I'll, I'll sit and go over some of my old songs. Um, you know, it, I'm always looking for ways of triggering creativity in, in myself somehow, you know. And is there, is there any advice that you would give? Let's imagine... We've got a listener just now. They're a you know, seventeen-year-old. Uh, they're just they 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 love playing guitar and they want to they want to be where you are. They want to do you know be the, the kind of performer that you are. Is mm. what, what advice would you give to that that seventeen-year-old? Um, be aware of your tuning. Make sure that you're absolutely in tune before you play in front of anybody. And I'm talking about spending time tuning, um, but your best thing is to have some good songs to play, you know. Um, uh, being, uh, having, having lots of tricks and, and gimmicks will not put bums on seats uh, and it will not hold people's attention or stir their emotions. You may surprise a few people with a few tricks, but you've got to have something absolutely real and solid to give to the people. So that takes time. Don't be in a hurry. Learn the good songs. Spend time. Make sure the arrangements are good. Practice with a metronome. Know what real time is. And, and uh, you know, record yourself and listen back. Make sure that everything's in the right place. Your tuning's good. Your tone is good. And all that sort of stuff. You know, you've just got to, you've really got to work on it. And you've got to hone it. Uh, and and keep honing it until your funeral. Then you can stop honing. <laughs> and it it kind of drives me insane a little bit when I when I do hear um, guitar players and the, if they get up on stage, and um, I call it the happy slappy thing. And uh, it's yeah. and obviously it's been inspired by grit. And I, I had uh, Michael Manring on the show uh, who worked with um, uh, Michael Hedges uh, for many years as well. And this place like yourself. Cool. So you you've got this this strong percussive thing in your playing, but. What probably a lot of people don't realize is you're a great drummer as well. Um, well and when I'm a, I, uh, I certainly have played the drums all my you're life. A, you're a good. You are a good drummer. You're a very yeah. good drummer. And and the thing that really frustrates me, and being a drummer myself, really frustrates me, is I see um, guitarists by trying to create this gimmick of of using the percussive thing, do yeah. it really really badly. Um, yeah. well, and it frustrates the hell out of me. The problem for me is I see guys 
trying to do what further on down the track from Michael Hedges. Mm. And so they've got, they've got this unusual tuning going on. Then they're, they've got a groove going and they're slapping away and then they're playing these chords. And you can't take it seriously because it looks like a science experiment. <laughs> yes. You know? It's, it looks like an experiment. And it's like, how much multitasking can you do? Just stop and play the song, yeah. you know, if there's a song there. I've had a few guys who shall remain nameless in this interview that have, I've welcomed to my show, and, but we had nothing to play together. And so I've had to invite them up out of courtesy, got them on stage, and then I had to walk off and leave them to play something on their own. You know, whereas somebody like your father and I could sit and play all day and have, a, have great musical conversation and entertain the audience and have fun. Um, but some of these guys who, you know, play everything in this unusual tunings and slap and, and tap and do all that, they, they're not jammers. They don't know anything about playing with other, uh, uh, other musicians. And that, that's a shame because they're missing out and so are the audience. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with changing the, the, um, the way that, that, that the, the guitar is perceived and also taking new techniques and new ideas and bringing them out there to the public. But... But I believe it's still got to be musical and, and it's got to be something that you can sing. So talking about musical, if you could recommend just one record that our listeners should go, go into Spotify, go into iTunes and go and check out just now, what would it be? It would have to be Donald Fagan, The, the Night Fly. It's still one of the greatest masterpieces I've ever heard of songwriting, playing and production. And just on a guitar uh, playing note, it's some of Larry Carlton's tastiest playing on that album. Fantastic. And we'll put this on the show notes. So if people go to icmponline.com forward slash podcast and put in Tommy's name, you'll be able to find the, the links to all these as well. So uh, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning, but you had yeah. to start from scratch. So all you have is your guitar and the, the knowledge that you've acquired over all these, these years of music. What yeah. would you do? How would you restart things? Uh, how would I restart things? I probably wouldn't. I'd probably sell all my guitars and go and buy a couple of ride-on mowers and start <laughs> on business. There's a, there's a lot of that work in Nashville then. <laughs> there's a lot of work for that everywhere. But no, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I don't want to start again. If I had to start again, I'd do something else. <laughs> okay. So share with, you know, we haven't even had a chance fully to talk about the, but, but the album, but share with the best ways that listeners can connect with you, can learn about your tour dates, because they come to see you live, okay. and also learn about the, the, the recordings you've got uh, happening. I have a website, which is TommyEmmanuel.com, and on that website is everything, including all my, my material, my CDs, my DVDs, there's uh, merchandise, uh, all sorts of stuff. You can write to me uh, through Facebook. I, I have a fan page on Facebook. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can, you can contact me uh, through my management if you wish. Uh, uh, I have the, uh, all the information on the website. But uh, if, if you want to talk to me personally, you can do it through Facebook. And we'll put all those links on the, on the show notes here as well. Tommy, thank Thanks. you so much for being so generous with your time and coming on on the show. It's uh, as always, it's great it's great speaking with you and learning you, um, what you're up to. And I wish you all the best with the with the new album and with all, all your touring for the rest of the year. Yeah, and don't you work too hard now? I won't. <laughs> and listen, uh, you, uh, just remember that your father once called me the abominable showman. <laughs> I'll remember that one. I'll remember that one. <laughs> Lots of love, James. Thank you. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.